I want to thank um, our special music this morning. It was very inspiring. I also want to thank the audiovisual people for the effort they've put in this morning to help me get this presentation going. Um, the title, as it was mentioned in the um, bulletin, is His City. Uh, Vern had asked me some time back uh, to go over some of the uh, slide pictures that we took when my wife and I went to Israel, or the Holy Land, as some people put it. Uh, and uh, it was meant to be, oh, what, about a month ago that I was supposed to present this. And I'm kind of glad I didn't do it then because it was a little more time consuming than I had thought. I, um, there, there, were, there were very many slides and I decided uh, to keep this a little shorter and present only a small portion of that trip. And so I'll ask that you bear with me on this small portion. Uh, maybe some other time we can do something else, but I want to cover just a small section uh, on this presentation. Um, you know, uh, as Christians and Seventh-day Adventists, um, we have a savior who we, um, who has presented us his love by coming here to this earth. And he is our example in everything. And Ellen G. White has told us that we should spend an hour every week studying his life, especially the last uh, events of his life on this earth. And um, it was um, wonderful for us to visit Israel this last spring and go through some of the places we went. So I would like to just talk about that. I'm going to just pull this out and see if we can get this to work here for a moment. So his city is the title. I want to look at this. We, we left in March from Las Vegas and went to Atlanta. And from Atlanta, we went all the way to Paris, as you can see there on the map. And from Paris, we then went to a place, let's see, if, there we go, in Jordan called Amman. I know that the map looks kind of, and help me if you don't under, can't hear me, let me know. Amman, Jordan. Uh, which is just east of Israel. And from Amman, we started our t tour, but I don't want to spend uh, a lot of time there uh, going over that area, but we, we traveled from Amman, went down to Petra, and then from Petra, we went to along the Dead Sea and over to Jerusalem. And from Jerusalem, we met up with a group of people from Loma Linda uh, Church and from many other places because the group was actually fairly large, so representing many churches in the United States, 150 people, three buses, the uh, people that went there. And um, we got to go to many places in Israel and I want to show this map, and I apologize that I can't point to it. I would have liked to point it to it, but if you'll notice on the uh, map, uh, just to the left of the Dead Sea, which is the long lake down at the bottom, is Jerusalem. I don't know how many of you can see that. I don't, do you see that over here? Right there. There's Jerusalem. Okay, and then from, Jeruz from Jerusalem, we went, spent a little time along the Dead Sea. Uh, we, did we did get into the Dead Sea and did some floating there, uh, because that's about all you can do is float, because there's nothing that lives on the Dead Sea. And then we went up to the Sea of Galilee 
and our presentation today is going to be in this area, uh, the Sea of Galilee. So how did we travel? Well, that's the question. Um, the traditional way? No, not really. That's my wife and my, myself. We did get on the camel because I don't, uh, I couldn't leave Israel and Jordan without at least getting on a camel, right? So we got on camels. I spent a little time on the camel because I was kind of worn out after about 18, 20,000 steps that day. And, and we spent a little time in Petra on the camel there. But we did go on buses. So there were three buses from uh, Loma, uh, that uh, the people from Loma Linda went on, and we spent the, the entire time traveling on these buses, uh, about 50 people per bus. And our group, our little group within the large group, our family, this is our, this is our family. Let's see if I can get it. There we go. Some of you might recognize some of those people in that group. Um, my wife and myself, Alpha and Omar, that used to be members of this church, my mother-in-law, uh, my brother-in-law, who's an ophthalmologist that went down to Honduras when we did the um, uh, Maranatha, and his uh, wife, and my nephew, who used to stay with us periodically uh, here in Kingman. So that was our little group out of the large group that went there. Uh, by the way, we're standing in front of a monument that I'm just going to, I didn't show you the monument, but that is a monument of um, Elijah at Mount Carmel. Okay, so that's where, where we stay. But I would like to, uh, at this moment, stop for a second, ask you to open your Bibles, and we're going to read again this uh, memory verse, because we're going to do a little bit of reading today, because I don't want to just show slides and not do some reading. So Luke 4, 31 and 32. So let's open that, and I want to look at that for a moment, give you a chance to read it, because I'm not putting it up on the screen. Okay. And it says... Then he went down to Capernaum. So I want you to remember that town, a town in Galilee. And on the Sabbath day, he taught the people. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had what? They had authority. Now, I want you to think about that. Um, why do we study the Bible? We study the Bible because it was inspired by God, who has authority. Have you been to a class and know that the teacher or professor is an authority in a field? How does that affect you with regard to the information that's being presented? You pay attention, do you not? Now, is there anyone that you know of that has more authority than Jesus Christ? Absolutely not. So when he came and presented something, or when he comes and presents something, or when God talks to you and says something, how should we respond? We should listen, right? And that's what Jesus Christ did when he came onto this planet. He came and talked to the people, and they listened because they knew he was speaking with authority. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, so let's look again at this region. By the way, Israel is divided into areas, and these areas include some Palestinian sections. There's a section right here called the Gaza Strip, a very significant area of contention. It's marked by a red line. Okay, the West Bank, 
And up here in orange is the Golan Heights to the east of the Sea of Galilee. You see it there? Up here on the north is Lebanon, and Syria is here, okay? Damascus is right up in there, okay? So just keep that in mind. These areas are occupied mostly by Palestinians, but there are some Israelis in all of these areas, except maybe not much in here, okay? So when, when we look at this, we have to keep those things in account, okay? Israel. Israel has its capital, which is Jerusalem. The official language is Hebrew. There's other recognized languages. The main one is Arabic. And the ethnic groups are Jewish and 74% and Arab is 20% and there's of course 4.8% is other. The religions, okay? Jewish, 74%, 17.8% Muslim, and only 2% is Christian, okay? There is 1.59% which are Druze, and I'll be talking about that a little bit later on, and 4.4% are other, okay? Population. The population of Israel is 9 million approximately. The density is 1,059 per square mile. I just want to use the United States density as a comparison. 92 people per square mile. Big difference, right? Big difference. Now I want to talk about distances, okay? So look at this. From Jerusalem to Amman, Jordan, 157 miles. From Jerusalem to Damascus, 199 miles. From Jerusalem to Cairo, 456 miles. From Jerusalem to Tiberias. Tiberias is on the western edge of the Sea of Galilee. So to get from Jerusalem to where we're going to go on this presentation today is about a little further than going from here to Las Vegas, okay? Area and distances. The area of Israel is between 8,000 and 8,500, depending on whether you're including some of these areas of Palestine, the Palestinians have, okay? And from north to south is 263 miles. Compare that from going here to Phoenix and think about those distances. That's Israel, okay? The width, 71 miles, less than going from here to Las Vegas. That's the width of Israel, okay? Okay, highest point, Mount Hermon. Mount Hermon is found on the northern ed, edge of, of Israel. Uh, at, it really is on the, uh, between Israel, Syria, and Lebanon. We'll see it a little later on. We see it's the highest point is at 7,336. It's actually taller than that because the tallest point is actually in in Syria at 9,000 feet. Lowest point, the Dead Sea at minus 1,368 feet. So now let's go to the Sea of Galilee. And I want to point to a, couple, a few areas here on the Sea of Galilee. Tiberias is right here. We've mentioned that. Over here, I want you to look at this little area because we're going to spend some time up here. This is Capernaum, okay? This area right in here. So we're going to keep that one in mind, okay? All right? So let's, we'll look at this a little later. I want, I'm pulling this out a little further because I want you to keep in mind, right here 
is Nazareth. Okay, right here is Cana. You remember Cana? What happened in Cana? The first miracle of Jesus, the miracle of the water to wine, right? Or grape juice, as someone would say, okay? All right. Let's see here. Okay, so we came driving down the road, and we saw this sign. As you can see, right here, they spell it a little different, Cana and Nazareth, because they're right next to each other, okay? What happened in Nazareth, by the way? That's where Jesus grew up, right. So let's, let's open our Bibles to Matthew 2, 19 through 23. Matthew 2, 19 to 23. I think I went back. This is Nazareth, by the way. So we'll read it while, we, while you're looking at Nazareth here. After Herod died, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up and take the child and his mother and go to the land of Israel, for those who were trying to take the child's life are dead. So he got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning in Judea in the place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. After having been warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee, and he went to live in a town called Nazareth. So was fulfilled what was said through the prophets that he would be called a Nazarene. Okay? So this is Nazareth. Does it remind you of where Jesus lived? No. Not really, does it? Kind of congested looking, doesn't it? With a lot of apartments, a lot of buildings, a little more modern than the time of Jesus, correct? So that's, what, that's Nazareth. I want to read from Desire of Ages, page 72, okay? It says, Christ was the only sinless one who ever dwelt on earth. Yet for nearly 30 years, he lived among the wicked inhabitants of Nazareth. This fact is a rebuke to those who think themselves dependent upon place, fortune, or prosperity in order to live a blameless life. Let me read that one statement again. This fact is a rebuke to those who think themselves dependent upon place, fortune, or prosperity in order to live a blameless life. Temptation, poverty, adversity is the very discipline needed to develop purity and firmness. Jesus lived in a peasant's home and faithfully and cheerfully acted his part in bearing the burdens of the household. He had been the commander of heaven and angels had delighted to fulfill his word. Now he was a willing servant and a loving, obedient son. He learned a trade. What was that trade? Carpenter. And with his own hands worked in the carpenter's office with Joseph. In the simple garb of a common laborer, he walked the streets of the little town, not much little anymore, Going and returning from his humble work, he did not employ his divine power to lessen his burdens or to lighten his toil. So we're seeing here Nazareth. Okay, what's the population of Nazareth now? 81,000. Okay, let me see if I can get this move. Oops, wrong direction. All right, this is the path that I want you to look at for a second. Uh, we're going up a hill next to Nazareth. I want you to think about what happened in Nazareth. Let's read Luke 4, 14 to 28. What happened in Nazareth? Okay. 
Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue. Well, all of you have heard this story, but I'm going to read it. As was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has appointed me, anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom to, for the prisoners, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set the press free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Okay. So, we're going to look a little further up this hill. Oops, I passed it, but here it is. We're at the top of a hill. What do you think might have happened here? I tried, but it doesn't want to go. Oh, there we go. Okay, so here we are. At the, the group is at the top of the mountain. Think about what happened at the top of this hill. We'll go a little further here. He wrote, then he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. It's interesting that phrase, fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Mm -hmm. Isn't this Joseph's son? they asked. Jesus said to them, Surely you will quote this proverb to me. Physician, heal yourself, and you will tell me, Do hear in your own home what we have heard that you did in Capernaum. Truly I tell you, he continued, No prophet is accepted in his own hometown. I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years, and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to the widow of Zarephath in the region of Sidon. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, but none, not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. All the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, drove him out of the town. We're out of the town here. And took him to the brow of the hill on which the town was built and in order to throw him off the cliff. But he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. This is where they feel that Jesus was taken. And... Um, we went up this mountain to look at this hill, and it was quite a ways down, let me tell you. Don't want to drop off of that place. But anyway, this is uh, Nazareth. From Nazareth to um, Capernaum or to Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee, we will talk about that in just a second. But next to Nazareth, what other town was there? Cana. And we went over there, and there's some flowers here that we took some pictures of, is Cana. I had to take a picture of this sign so you would know that this is Cana. And they're advertising Cana Wedding Wine. <laughs> <laughs> so someone must have, by the way, in this area, this is, this is the um, we, uh, West Bank Mostly Air, um, Palestinians live in these areas. Mostly Palestinians, not Israeli people. And yet they cater to the tourist people in this area. Okay. So let's go back and look at the, let's look at, back at the Sea of Galilee. Well, I, I went a little ahead here. Uh, let's see if I can get, to, there we go. Again. Remember, here is Nazareth, Nazareth down here, and Cana right here. 
And we're going to be looking at Capernaum because we have something to talk about, Capernaum. Okay, Nazareth, Cana, and we went into Cana. So let's take a look at that. Let's look at the Sea of Galilee. The Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake on earth at minus 705 feet. It has a circumference of 33 miles. It is 13 miles long and 8.1 miles wide. And it has a maximum depth of 141 feet. And what is it fed by? Does anyone know? The Jordan River, okay? So I want, the, the, the Sea of Galilee has many names and I'm gonna name them here for you. Here it is, the Sea of Kinneret, as we can read in Numbers 34.11 and Joshua 13.27, okay. In Luke 5.1, it says the Lake of Gennesaret. And in Matthew 4.18, 15.25, Mark 1.16 and 7.31, they call it the Sea of Galilee. And in the Roman text, they used to call it the Sea of Tiberias, as we have that town that's next to it called the Sea of uh, Tiberias. And in Arabic, they call it the Sea of Mania. Okay. So I want to go over uh, the distance from Nazareth to Capernaum. Okay. The distance is... 20 miles if you go in a straight line. But there's a trail that people take. People that live in that, that visit that area, sometimes they take a trail that goes from Nazareth through Cana and on through that area that's about 40 miles. So if, if you're energetic and you want to try that someday, that's a trail that you can take that probably is similar to what Jesus and his disciples might have done, okay? Um, I want to open the Bible again to Matthew 3.13. And let's read that. I'm going to look at that. I'm, I still have some time here. I'm running out of time. But I want to go through that real quick here. And let's read that, Matthew 3, 13. And it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to John at the Jordan to be baptized by him. Okay, so where was he? He was at the Jordan. And where did he come from? Galilee. From Galilee. Okay, so let's go to Matthew 4, 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit, where did he leave? He was leaving the Jordan after he was baptized into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And we've, re we've read many times that temptation, right? Now let's move to Matthew 4, 12 to 16. Matthew 4, 12 to 16. Now when Jesus had heard that John had been put in prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Galilee, he came and dwelt in Capernaum, which is by the sea, in the region of Zebulun and Naphtali. And it became, it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, in the land of Zebulun and in the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light and upon those who sat in the region and shadow of death, light was dawned. So he went to Galilee. And who lived in there? Gentiles, right? Okay. So we're going to go back and look at that. I want to look again at this map 
and point again to where Capernaum is, right up here, northern western part of the Sea of Galilee. Okay? I'm trying to get, make it like you feel like you're there. Okay? There's Capernaum, right there. Okay? That's Capernaum. I want you to keep this area in mind also. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay? So that's Capernaum. I'm going to read from Desire of Ages, page 252 and 53. At Capernaum, Jesus dwelt in the intervals of his journeys to and fro, and it came to be known as his own city, as the title of our presentation is today. It was on the shores of the Sea of Galilee and near the borders of the beautiful plain of Gennesaret, if not actually upon it, the deep depression of the lake gives to the plain that skirts its shores the genial climate of the south. Here in the days of Christ flourished the palm tree and the olive. Here were the orchards and vineyards, green fields and brightly blooming flowers in the rich luxuriance, all watered by the living streams bursting from the cliffs. The shores of the lake and the hills that at a little distance encircled it were dotted with towns and villages. The lake was covered with fishing boats. Everywhere was stir, was stir of busy and active life. Okay, so here is the sign to Capernaum. You can see there the, the grassy fields up above it. Okay. Capernaum itself was well adapted to be the center of the Savior's work, being on the highway from Damascus to Jerusalem and Egypt and to the Mediterranean Sea. It was a great thoroughfare of travel. People from many lands passed through the city and tarried for rest in their journeys to and fro. Here Jesus could meet all nations and all ranks, the rich and great, as well as the poor, lowly, and his lessons would be carried to other countries and into many households. Investigation of the prophecies would thus be excited. Attention would be directed to the Savior, and his mission would be brought before the world. And here we have the entrance to Capernaum. What does the sign say? Can you read that? I don't know if you can. But it says, Capernaum, the town of? Jesus. Notwithstanding the actions of the Sanhedrin against Jesus, the people eagerly waited the astir with interest. Angels were preparing the way for his ministry, moving upon men's hearts and drawing them to the Savior. So here at Capernaum is where Christ spent much of his time and his ministry. So finally we get to visit if I can move, the Sea of Galilee, the shores of the Sea of Galilee. And here's part of our group standing around at the Sea of Galilee. And we couldn't leave without at least, let's see if I can get this moving. There's, there's a boat on the Sea of Galilee. And as you can see, it's pretty calm, right? Not like when Christ had to calm the the lake after that thunderstorm. And of course I couldn't leave without a picture with Randy Roberts and his wife. And if you look across the other side of the lake, there on the eastern part of the lake you can see a lot of homes and uh, hotels and other things on the other side and here's another picture of the lake closer up that's the Sea of Galilee okay and then we did take a ride on a boat if I can get this moving here we go we got on one of these boats and spent a little time on the lake okay and so that you can know we were on there, there's my wife sitting in the boat with her brother and sister. And a picture of me with a couple, of, a few other people. So let's open our Bibles again 
to Luke 4, 31 to 37. And it says, Then he went down to Capernaum, a town in Galilee, and on the Sabbath he taught the people. We've read this one, but I want to continue. They were amazed at his teaching because his words had authority. In the synagogue, there was a man possessed by a demon, an impure spirit. He cried out at the top of his voice, Go away, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy you? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Be quiet, Jesus said sternly, come out of him. Then the demon threw the man down before them all and came out without injuring him. All the people were amazed and said to each other, what words these are. With authority and power he gives orders to impure spirits and they come out and the news about him spread throughout the surrounding area. So here near Capernaum, Jesus met at a synagogue and here is the remnants of a synagogue. Now, I have to be realistic. The only remnant is at the base of the synagogue. This is actually a synagogue built upon the synagogue where Christ was, as you can see there, okay? But this is the actual location where Christ met and taught the people, okay? And you can see another picture here where the group is sitting as part of that synagogue. So let's continue in Luke 4, 38 and 39. It says, Jesus left the synagogue and went to the home of Simon. Now Simon's mother-in-law was suffering from a high fever, and they asked Jesus to help her. So he bent over her and rebuked the fever and left her. She got up at once and began to wait on them. Okay, now I bring that up because next to this synagogue, there's the synagogue, we can barely see it on the left hand side, right, right there. And over in this area was Peter's house, or his mother-in-law's house, as some would say. And we'll talk about, hopefully we can talk about that a little bit more. They have what one of the archaeologists, by the way, there were two archaeologists with us from La Sierra. This, this was the remnants of Peter's house, right here. And above it, he calls this a UFO that the people built to protect it. It looks like a UFO, but it looks like a big structure they used to kind of protect it from the elements. But this was Peter's house, or his mother-in-law's house. And they expanded it to have meetings underneath here. But it was a big, wide open area, and, uh, and they had a, an area where the fishermen would fix their nets. And, and that was where P Peter would go and spend time with his family. There you, there you can see it again. The UFO above and the house, the house below. Okay. Now, I want to go and look at one other thing here. They found something in 1986. By a, a boat was discovered in 1986 by amateur archaeologists during a drought. And we'll show you this picture. Here it is. This boat was from the first century AD, made of 10 different pieces, types of wood. Okay, it is much like the boat that Jesus and his disciples would have used. Okay, and they have it inside a museum there. But this is the type of boat that, Christ, we cannot say that it's the boat that Christ used, of course, but it is the same type of boat that they would have used in the time of Jesus. And they have created a, a full picture of, of what it would have looked like in their time. And there you have it, right there. Okay. 
So let's open our Bibles again to Matthew 5, 1 through 5. Okay. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, and he went up on a mountainside and sat down. His disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And he said... And we all know these verses well, do we not? Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And Jesus went, the first part of this, this uh, chapter, it's, I'm going to read it again. Now when Jesus saw the crowds, he went where? up on a mountainside and sat down. This mountainside is called the Mount of Beatitudes. And here we're going to the Mount of Beatitudes. Okay? And here we are at the top of the Mount of Beatitudes. And as you know, every, they all build things on there to, for the tourists, but this is where, we, where it is. And as you can see, this is our group. Our group is sitting down there. They've created an amphitheater-like place, and they're all sitting there because we're going to have a discussion regarding this area. And, and uh, there's Randy Roberts and a bunch of, bunch of the church members there are all sitting in this area. We're getting ready to have a discussion about that, about this area. And uh, going back just a second, and let me just... See if I can go back here for a minute. I don't know if I can, but well, anyway, we're going to continue talking about. It. But let's go and 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 talk about the, what basically the Mount of Beatitudes overlooks the Sea of Galilee, and and you can see where Christ gave this sermon on the on the Beatitudes to the whole crowd of people there. Let's read Matthew 14, verses 13 to 18. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place. It is already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have only five loaves of bread and two fishes, they answered. Bring them here, he said, and he directed the people to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fishes and looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied, and the disciples picked up the twelve baskets and broke pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So, but it's still, there we go. So this is the area that they feel was the general area where Jesus fed the 5,000. And we're looking up at it from, from below, and as you look at it from above, you can see right in there is the Sea of Galilee. And this is that big area where Christ probably fed the 5,000. Okay? Now, we're going to talk about a new area that was just discovered not even 10 years ago. Uh, so let's read about it. Matthew 15, 39. Okay. Matthew 15, 39. There's only one mention of this area in the Bible, and it says, And he sent away the multitude and took a ship and came into the coasts of Magdala. Now, that's in the King James Version. It's mentioned a little different in the New International Version. But here is 
Magdala. Welcome to Magdala. Now, what what is what do we know about Magdala? Well, there was a lady who was from Magdala. Her name was Mary of Magdalene. Okay, and what they dis- what happened in Magdala was that a f- some years ago, uh, a Pentecostal group had planned on possibly purchasing a property there in Magdal, in Magdal, Migdal, and they finally decided against it. So a Catholic church decided they were going to build something there. But as it, is, as it occurs in Israel all the time, before you can build anything, they have to get an okay from the archaeological uh, group, uh, society in that area to make sure there's nothing there that, uh, that is hidden in the ground. And sure enough, they found a, the Migdal Synagogue dated to the first century CE, the oldest synagogue found in Galilee and one of the oldest in the world. The location where Mag- Mary of Magdalene was from and where Christ most likely taught here. And we can see that in this location, and this, by the way, is only a few miles north of the town of Tiberias, by the way. Here is some of the ruins of that uh, synagogue. One of the interesting things about it is they have right here in the center is this little type stone table, the only one of its kind that they've found anywhere. This is probably where they put the scriptures on to read or the scrolls. And on this t- this table is a menorah. Do you know what a menorah is? A menorah is a like a candlestick. So if anyone had any questions of what the reality of what it looked like, here was one of the oldest uh, uh, carvings of a menorah on, on a, on a uh, archaeological find that they've ever found. Okay. Now, in this area, the Catholic Church also built a, uh, a uh, church uh, for basically uh, giving a kind of a credit to the women of the church. And in there, they have a painting. And I want you to look at this painting and tell me what, it, what you think of. Let's see if I can get this in here. There we go. So what do you think of? What does this represent? Close. Let's read it, Luke 8, 43 to 48, and then you'll see it. Eight forty-three to 48. And a woman, remember this is about women, And a woman having an issue of blood, 12 years, which had spent all her living upon physician, neither could be healed of any, came behind him and touched the border of his garment. And immediately her issue of blood stanched. And Jesus said, Who touched me? When all denied, Peter and they that were with him said, Master, the multitude thronged thee and pressed thee and sayest thou who touched me? And Jesus said, Someone hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue has gone out of me. And when the woman saw that she was not hid, she came trembling and falling down before him. She declared unto him before all the people for what cause she had touched him and how she was healed immediately. And he said unto her, Daughter, be of good comfort, for thy faith hath made thee whole. Go in peace. Okay. And... We went into the town of Tiberias, and in and the time of the year in the Tiberias, and I'm getting closer to the end, so bear with me here. <laughs> uh, in the town of Tiberias, at the time of the year we went, they had what is called the Feast of Purim. Do you know what that is? 
Do you remember the Feast of Purim? Let's, let's read about it. Okay. Esther 9, 18. They were having the Feast of Purim. So I want to read about it so you remember it. Esther 9, 18. But the Jews that were at Shushan assembled together on the 13th day thereof and on the 14th day thereof and on the 15th day of the same day they rested and made it a day of feasting and gladness as the days 22 as the days wherein the Jews rested from their enemies and on the month which was turned unto them from sorrow to joy and from mourning into a good day by the way why were they from sorrow to joy does anyone remember because Naaman had done what? He wanted to kill all the Jews. And they had turned, Esther had turned that around. Isn't that right? Yes. That they should make them days of feasting and joy and sending portions one to another and gifts to the poor. Verse 24. Because Haman, the son of Hamadatha, the Agatite, the enemy of all the Jews had devised against the Jews to destroy them and had cast poor, that is, the lot, to consume them and to destroy them. Verse 26. Wherefore they call these days Purim, after the name of Pur. Therefore all the words of this letter and all that which they have seen concerning this matter and which had come unto them. Verse 28. And that these days should be remembered and kept throughout every generation. When, how long? Every generation. every generation. And that's why we were seeing it when we went to Tiberias. Every family, every province, and every city, and that these days of Purim should not fail from among the Jews, nor the memorial of them perish from their seed. And what we saw was they would dress up... the. It was during school days, and they would dress up their kids, and the kids would go to school. And I only took, we only took a few pictures. We would have liked to have taken some more, but we only took a few pictures of the kids. And these kids would dress up, and you can see them in the background there. I had to take these from, we had to take these from the bus. But they're all dressed up there. It was almost like it was Halloween. And they were all dressed up for this day of Purim. There's a girl there all dressed up in her, her outfit. Another one here looks like a soldier. And so they would, and here's another girl here dressed up in a different outfit. And so they did that. Now, this is a little different. One of the things that's interesting in Israel is that although the Orthodox Jews are, the, are not a large percentage of the Jews, they do control a lot of the politics. And they come in many different societies within the Orthodox. There's a lot of different Orthodox groups. But this is an Orthodox Jew, and you can see he's got a different type of hat. They have all kinds of different hats. Many different. Some are huge, and some are small. But there, there's, I want to show you a picture of one, one of the Orthodox Jews that was standing there. And they, they keep their religion very, very strictly. Okay. Now, this is Mount Hermon. I mentioned Mount Hermon. It's, it straddles Lebanon, Syria, and Israel to the north. And then we'll continue here. There's another picture, and you can see how Israel has a lot of vegetation. And they, they have a lot of co-ops, and they do a tremendous amount of agriculture in their country. There's hardly a place that's not worked on in Israel. So... Remember, I taught, mentioned at the beginning, there's the Druze. They're only a small percentage of the people that live in Israel. But these people are Druze here, right there. These girls are Druze. And I'll tell you a little bit about them real quickly. And you can see there's some guys here. They all wear these white caps. They are a different religious group. There's about a million, million of them throughout the world. The majority live in Syria, Lebanon, and Israel, but there's some that live in um, Venezuela, United States, Argentina, 
uh, and they, they feel their religion is a mixture of um, Muslim beliefs, Christianity, um, paganistic reincarnation, and they do not mix with other people, but they're protected by the Israeli people. The, is, the Muslims do not get along with them. So they're protected by the, the Israeli people. And so I just wanted to mention, and they believe that, that Jethro, that one, was one of their prophets. You know who Jethro was, right? Moses' uncle was one of their prophets. So I just wanted to mention, they, they live up there in the northern part of Israel and in the borders of, of uh, Jerusalem, of, uh, of Israel with, with uh, near Mount Hermon up in that area. Okay, so this is that synagogue in Capernaum where Christ spent a lot of his time teaching and preaching. But before we close, I want to read one more paragraph from Ellen G. White, because even though my wife and I enjoyed very much um, going to Israel, and this is only a very small portion of the areas that we went to, uh, I want to keep in mind something very important. And I'm going to read from Desire of Ages, page 640 and it says many feel that it would be a great privilege <laughs> to visit the scenes of Christ's life on earth to walk where he trod to look upon the lake beside which he loved to teach and the hills and valleys on which his eyes so often rested but we need not go to Nazareth, to Capernaum, or to Bethany in order to walk in the steps of Jesus. We shall find his footprints beside the sickbed, in the hovels of poverty, in the crowded alleys of the great city, and in every place where there are human hearts in need of consolation. In doing as Jesus did when on earth, we shall walk in his steps. Let, us be that, let, let that be our prayer this Sabbath morning as we open our hymns this morning to hymn number 624.